today we're gonna pick up on the rest which the main idea not only of today but of the whole book is this one phrase the just shall live by faith and that undergirded really all of last week's message it undergirds everything that we're gonna to say today out of that today is stemming three other things one is that the glory of the Lord is ultimately going to cover the earth and that's 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 rooted in faith that's it's connected to faith secondly is that secondly is that uh, we praise God in all circumstances and then lastly is the reason why we praise God in all circumstances is because the Lord will ultimately bring victory that's what he always does and so even while there's a limited moment of time where the enemy the Babylonians, so to speak, may be doing something that seems like it's bringing a, it's something against God's people and, and God's purposes. God ultimately, it will leverage all of it to bring about his good. And so let's get into it right now. Firstly, with this core idea that the just shall live by faith. God's will for his people has always been that his people follow him by faith. As simple as it is. It's, it's really so simple, but I love the simplicity of the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, and to give a picture of what that would look like is what we saw in the life of Jesus, because Jesus is the full representation of the kingdom of God. He is the father incarnate. And what did he do when he came into the earth? He went to people and he said these words, come follow me. And it really is as simple as that. That is at the core of God's purposes being done in our lives through the church in the earth is a people who respond to Jesus to come and follow him. And that's what faith looks like. We've had a lot of different ideas in the church of what faith is. That is what faith is. It looks like following Jesus. To follow Jesus means to recognize who he is. He's the leader. He's the supreme in authority. To follow Jesus is not only to believe that he did certain things on the cross on my behalf. That's part of it. That it's not only to believe that his blood alone atones for my sin, that's part of it. It is to place my confidence in the person of Jesus, and just like they did 2,000 years ago, to follow him. So that's always been the purposes of God for his people. That's how his purposes come about, is as a people follow him. And that is what, ultimately, when God brings the Babylonians in our lives, it's ultimately simply to bring us back to that place where we, with childlike faith, are returning to simply following Jesus and putting all of our eggs in the Jesus basket. God is calling us, I believe, right here, to a deeper place of following him. In other words, that we are not leaning upon any other thing than him and that we are sitting quietly at his feet to hear his voice and that as a people, just like has always been his purpose for his people, that when he speaks, that's when we move. And we only move in what he speaks. So the just shall live by faith. Let's read this classic line, chapter two, verse four. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. This is the only scripture you're gonna find in the Old Testament, right there, that is quoted three full times in the New Testament, just to underscore the importance of this core idea that the just shall live by faith. And before it, God says that the proud is, that, is, that his soul is not upright within himself. So we see two ideas here. Again, simplicity, two ideas, faith and pride. God's, God is doing something to bring a, down the pride in people to displace it with faith, the proud and the faith. And so understand just the simplicity that God, that ultimately so much of the problems in our lives, so much of the problems in the church and the world is rooted in human pride and the pride of humanity is displaced by faith in Jesus. And so it goes on to just kind of describe some of the out flows the manifestations of this pride if you'll read along with me i just want to give some of those descriptor the, the descriptors that habakkuk gives or that god gives through habakkuk of the proud one is that the proud are always wanting more and the reason i'm wanting to say this is let's 
let's take stock of what pride looks like and let's make sure we make a decision that we're not going to be this. So one manifestation of pr pr pride, I wanna say proudness, pride, is that we're always wanting more. If you'll read along with me in verse five, indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man and he does not stay at home because he enlarges his desire as hell. And he is like death and cannot be satisfied, constantly wanting more. Another manifestation of this uh, pride is gaining at others' expense and seeking promotion at others' expense. A huge thing. This happens all, all the time in the workplace. Happens all the time in politics. Happens all the time in various social settings. Trying to look for our own gain even if somebody else has to make an expense for it. It's, it's human pride. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, verse 9, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. And that, I, that wording, covets evil gain, means to gain something in an unrighteous or even a violent manner. Another manifestation would be building your empire on hurting others. Very similar to the last one. Verse 12 says, Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Another manifestation of pride, verse 15, is seeking to take advantage of people by deception or by making them vulnerable. We don't want to do that. Verse, verse 19, or verse 15 says, Even to make him drunk that you may look, up, excuse me, woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk that you may look on his nakedness. Trying to make somebody, get somebody drunk so that you can hear something, hear them spill beans that they otherwise wouldn't say or take advantage of them. Verse 19 is, an, is another one. Trusting in things that are seen rather than the God who is not seen. Verse 19, woe to him who says to wood, awake, to silent stone, arise. It shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. And so the antidote to this pride, as we said, is faith. Why does God send the Babylonians to his people? To bring them back, not just to punish them, not to be mean, not to be terrible. It is to bring them back to the place that is their God-given inheritance, a place of following him with childlike faith, where he does as he knows is best, and as he does what he knows is best, it's in all of our best interests and we walk in the fullness of his plan for us the opposite of that when we begin to veer from from faith we begin to do the things that we just described we begin to try to build our own empire we begin scratching and clawing trying to make our way forward and the way of the people of god is to trust in god and let him do what he wants to do as he wants to do it and so the antidote to this pride, I believe, is found in verse 18. And let's read it together, verse 18 through 20. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it, the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols? Woe to him who says to wood, awake, to silent stone, arise, it shall teach. What's he talking about? He's talking about how man will take what is made and will try to begin to worship him. In that time, it was idolatry. And you may say, well, I don't have any carven images that I'm worshiping in my living room. Uh, this does not apply to me. Oh, yeah, but do we trust in a dollar bill? Do we trust in our job? Do we trust in a person uh, as our source? Do we trust in the government as our source? Do we trust in whatever it may be as our source? Where, where are we trusting in? What are we looking for for ultimate direction and guidance in our lives? Yet there is no breath at all, verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. I, I want to suggest to us that that is a picture of instead of the idolatry where we're seeking the things of the natural world for our guidance and for our sustenance, the profession that we know God does exist. He is in his holy temple, and as a consequence, let everyone sit quietly before him. What is that? That is looking to him, to hear from him, to hear what he has to say. That, my friends, 
is the antidote to the pride of man. It is the thing that Jesus, when Mary and Martha were squabbling and Martha was upset because Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet while Martha was doing all the tough work, and, and Martha went over to Jesus and said, aren't you gonna do something about this? Like, make her work with me. And, and Jesus' response was, Martha, Martha, you are encumbered about with many things, and they're all useful, but Mary has chosen that one good part, and that will not be taken away from her. Sitting at his feet is the antidote to the pride of man to hear him that we would be led by him, sitting at his feet. Stemming from this, so sitting quietly at his feet, comes from acknowledging who he is. In other words, you, when you know something of who Jesus is, that is when you sit at his feet. If you, don't, if you just think he's a dude, like a great man or something, you're not gonna sit at his feet. You're, you may hear him for a bit or whatever, but when you understand he's the son of God, he is God incarnate. He is the, the savior of mankind. He is Lord of all creation. Then we can sit at his feet and that is an expression of faith. But here's the thing, faith begets faith. Because as we see him and we choose to voluntarily sit at his feet so that we can hear him, as we hear him, it is through the hearing of what he says to us that more faith is born. And then as we step out in faith and do the things that he says to do, and we see him come through, more faith is born. And we go back to seeing, sitting at his feet and, and talking to him. And this is the, the, love, the love and faith circle that God has called us to be into. It's seeing him, he, choosing to hear him, doing what he says, and going back and hearing him and seeing him and, and so on and so forth. This is what we're called to do. And as a result of that, the revelation of God, the manifestation of God ultimately is going to cover all of this earth. So if you'll look with me in uh, chapter 2 verse 14, it says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I just want to take stock of what we just read. The earth, in other words, as this prophet is asking God what is he going to do? How can he let these people who are more unrighteous than his own people take over his own people? How is that fair? In the context of God's answer to that question, he makes this statement, this declaration to the prophet and to each of us through that prophet that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Anybody know how the waters cover the sea? It's pretty absolutely. And it's deep. It is supreme. The coming of the glory, the knowledge, where all mankind are going to see and know who he is, that day is coming. There will be a day marked by heaven where Jesus Christ will return and he will be seen by all of creation. And in that moment, Paul says, the apostle, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. In that moment, Jesus Christ is is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The reason that we have this pride issue in the, in, the, in the current, in the now, is because the knowledge of his glory does not yet cover all of the, all of the earth as the waters cover the sea. And we wake up and we get into a fight with our spouse and we're not sensing any of the glory of the Lord. And then we've got financial troubles and we're not even seeing or feeling the glory of the Lord. And then we go and we see on the news all of the problems that are going on, the heart-wrenching problems in our world and in our country and COVID-19 and everything else. And we are not sensing the glory of the Lord and, and we begin to feel feelings and we begin to have thoughts and that are all rooted in not really believing God is here. God is with us. And we begin to look for other things and that's where all this behavior comes from. But here is the thing that God is calling his people to, is those who have seen the king, those who have placed their faith and, and know him, he dwells inside of us. And inside of every person who's given their life to Jesus, the something of the glory of the Lord exists inside of us. And you can tap into that place through communion with him, where even if you don't see it with your eyes, you begin to sense in your heart the knowledge of his glory. Now, why am I saying this? 
God said this promise of the, uh, the manifestation of his and the knowledge of his glory in the context of talking about returning his people to faith. And consequently, we can say there is a connection to the knowledge of his glory covering the earth and the faith of his people. Why is that? One is because of what I just described, that as we, know, as we walk in this darkened world, but believe in, in, and know in our hearts his existence, we begin to follow him even though we don't see him. But the second thing is, as we follow Jesus, as we hear him, as we're led of him, we're led by the one who is glorious. And his glory begins to manifest through the church as we take action steps of faith to do what he says to do. That is the ultimate purpose of the church and the earth is that we are the sons and daughters of God, Romans 8 says, and all creation is groaning, not just for the manifestation of the, of the Son of God, but the manifestation of the sons of God, that God, Jesus, would be glorified through his church. Isaiah 60 says, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And so as we return to a place of faith, the promise is, that his glory manifests through us, his people, that has always been his purpose for his people is not just that we would do good, that the world would see and know the glory of God through the church, through faith. And I wanna say this to us, that God is calling us to follow him in a deeper way by faith so that he would manifest his glory through us. I'm talking to Border City Church. That is our call. That is what he wants is for people to see and know the glory of God. So the third chapter, that, that's all the second chapter that we've been talking about. The third chapter begins with the prophet praying to God. And as he begins to pray, he begins to prophesy again. He begins to describe a vision that he sees of God in absolute sovereignty and greatness ruling over all the affairs of the earth. And so what began in chapter one with Habakkuk talking about his burden of what he's seeing with his physical eyes. How many of you have ever been burdened by seeing the, the situation as, the, as it exists? Maybe you're looking at the news, maybe you're just looking at the circumstances in your life or your family and you're burdened. You're burdened. You're not sensing glory schmory. Does that rhyme? You're burdened. And you're going to God just like the prophet did and, and asking and I wanna encourage you, sometimes it's important to not just feel like you have to fairy, fairy, fairy spirituality and sweep it all under the, if you're hurting your bird to go ahead and go right to God and ask him. And he begins to, re, to respond. And so that's, that's, what, that's where we started this burden. But in the process of the, of the book of Habakkuk, we see, a trans, we see God saying what he's going to do and Habakkuk doesn't even know, like, how does that justify? You're going to bring the Babylonians, and there's this whole thing. But it ends with Habakkuk seeing God's sovereignty, that he is far above all of the happenings of the earth. I just want to say this over each of us in the issues that we're dealing with, is that there is a sovereign God over all of it, and he is well able to use all of it to ultimately bring about his purposes. And, and the best thing that he can do to use those evil things in our lives is to bring us back into a deeper place of faith that he can do through us whatever he wants to do, which will always be glorious. And so we begin this third chapter with this revelation where Habakkuk is seeing, instead of the burden and the situation, he's seeing this greatness of God, and it ends with these two things that we also will end with today, is one is to praise God in all circumstances. Not because it's you're a, such a good Christian and you've learned to praise God even though you feel like screaming and crying and killing somebody. It is because you've seen something. You praise Him, not because it's just because you're so spiritual, it's simply because of it being in tune with reality. He doesn't change. His goodness does not change. No matter what changes or what things look like in our little sphere of time, his goodness doesn't change in his purpose because of his sovereignty 
over all the earth, his goodness will come about. We just had the privilege of walking with him as he does it. And so we praise God. And I just want to turn our attention there. Chapter 3, if you'll look there with me, verse 17 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food. Does this sound like a good circumstance? Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me to walk on my high heels. Though all the major resources upon which we depend, and all of us get used to depending on some stuff. A whole lot of people right now are depending on pandem pandemic unemployment agency insurance relief. And, and the list goes on of the things that we learn to depend. I'm sure it was not a sinful thing for Habakkuk to have learned to depend on the figs being growing on the fig tree. And this was a major part of the staple diet of, the, of those people is fig cakes. It wasn't a problem that Habakkuk had, had learned to need the fruit of the vine because that's where they got their drink from. And for the olive tree to bring about the expected olives each year because that's where they got their oil, which for many of us, that would be like our butter in terms of our cooking. For there to be uh, the cattle in the stalls and for the sheep to be a part of the flock, that's where they got clothing, that's where they got meat and sustenance. All, though, though none of these things would be in place. How many of you have ever been there? It's like I lose that. Well, at least I still have that, that, and that. Oh, that's all gone too. And you're just like, God, where are you? Like you've taken it all away. He says, though all of those things be gone, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. You can only do that when you see the greatness and the sovereignty of God that though, no matter what it may look like right now in my physical frame of view, I know from the spiritual frame of view that he is above it all and he remains good through it all and is way more powerful than any of the issues that I'm dealing with in my current circumstances. Habakkuk had a vision from God that would have led him to feel as though all those circumstances are probably going to come about. Why? Babylonians are on their way and they're gonna overthrow our people and they're gonna decimate our whole city. He was expecting these circumstances to come but before it even came, God spoke and gave him something to cling on to when that time comes to rejoice in the Lord when it happens. Why? Because I am doing a good thing. Rejoice in the Lord. You know what that word for the Hebrew words that are translated rejoice in the Lord actually mean? I, I, it, doesn't mean it doesn't just mean that. It means something bigger. Bob's back there starting to get it on. It's translated a little weak, if I could humbly suggest. It means to jump for joy in the Lord. Now, do you know what the, the, the yeah, I'm starting to make some of you feel uncomfortable, I don't care. Joy in the God of my salvation. That's, uh, what does that actually mean? Joy in the God of my salvation? The original Hebrew there actually meant to spin with dancing. Hello, hi. <laughs> spin with dancing. We're talking about hilarious, exuberant, the kind of thing when the Tigers beat the Reds six to four, not that there were fans in the stands anyway, when you are just hilariously excited, that's what it's talking about. We're talking, we're not just talking about doing the solemn good thing to rejoice in the Lord, though the cattle is not in the stall, yet I will praise him. We're talking about celebration in the midst of that. They were talking about that is what faith looks like. But some of you may say, honestly, like, I don't know if I can do that. Like, if, if all my stuff is taken from me, I don't e really know if I can legit do that. How can, I, how can I do that if it's just all bad? This is what I want to say to you. It's not all bad. God is faithful. Te circumstances are temporary. The Apostle Paul said, I have learned to be content in all things, whether I am abased or whether I am abounding. I've learned 
He is faithful and he's always good. The scripture says that the Lord is always leading us into victory, which is the very thing I want to say. Why do we praise in all circumstances? Because the Lord will bring victory. The Lord will bring victory. The Lord will bring victory. Verse chapter 3 verse 18, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me to walk on my high heels. God, the, the, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The, the uh, original Hebrew word there for salvation is yesha. Yesha. And, and it, it literally means deliverance. It means prosperity. The God of my salvation. Let's, let's put, plug some other words to elaborate on that. The God of my deliverance. He's the God of my prosperity. He's the God of my victory. Let's see if there's any more. He's the God of my welfare. And the, and the, the word, Yesha is, is very simply, it means oftentimes translated as salvation. It's the base of Jesus' own name. You know, Jesus wasn't called Jesus 2,000 years ago. You know that, right? His name in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The nature of Jesus is to bring me deliverance and prosperity and welfare and ultimately victory. And so the Lord God is the next thing that the prophet says. The Lord God is my strength. And it, he's, caught the, he's caught the idea that God had always been trying to teach the people to deliver them from idolatry. And I know none of us, again, think that we are idolatrous, but all of us have issues of idolatry. All of us so easily begin to trust in things other than the Lord. If you don't believe me, then look at how your heart responds when the cattle is removed from the stall and when the fig tree isn't yielding its fruit. What do we begin to do? We begin to trust in something else. We begin to try to fix our problem with our own strength rather than trusting that the Lord is good and he is still bringing about victory through, it, through the midst of it. The Lord God is my strength, the prophet says. He's my strength. He's my source. I've caught on to what he's trying to teach me. He's my strength. I've got no strength in myself. I've got no strength in any created thing. The Lord God is my strength. When we... This idea of him being strong, let me just say, is in the context of God returning his people to faith. And so I want to say to us that the Lord God is our strength Hello, Mr. Boat. Not because we are perfect. This promise is given to people who respond and return to faith. I'm going to say that again. This promise of the Lord being our strength is not because we are perfect. The Lord is not needing our perfection. He is wanting to simply have us return at a heart level to come, follow me. Follow me. And what will he do? He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me to walk on my high hill. Some of you Americans in here, especially you Michiganders, you have no idea what, what he's talking about because there are no high hills around here. What are you talking about? You've seen deer, but you've never seen a high hill before. And I can tell you, having been in, in South Africa, I can remember uh, going into the, the, game, the game reserves and driving through and and you would, you would see the, the, the lower areas where all the, the lush grasses were growing up and the, where the lion would hide under, under the, the tall golden grasses and, and creep upon the prey. And, and there were tons of wildebeest and, and antelope of various kinds. But then you would drive around uh, what, some of these craggly, very sharp, rocky mountains and you would see like there was no way that I could ever walk up there because all of the rocks are so sharp and you would slip and the rocks would fall but then you would see these impala or these springbok and they would just dance up this mountain as if it was just like the valley the valley the 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 high rocky hill was all the same for them they could just leap upon the impala just leap upon and and uh, that's what the prophet was seeing in that moment and that's the promise that God has given that those places that most of the rest of the folk look up there and say, I couldn't even go up there if I tried. God is saying, you trust in me? 
you spin with hilarious joy in faith in me in the midst of your circumstances, you respond, you return to your place, oh my child, to your place of faith, I will make you go up and, and walk right through the places that other people can't go as if it were effortless when everyone else says that they couldn't even go into that place. I will be your deliverer. I will be your salvation. I want to say to us, to, as, a, as a people this morning, this thing of the central theme of the book of Habakkuk, God using all sorts of stuff to return his people to faith, that his glory would be made known to us, and that ultimately as we follow him and do actions, his glory would manifest through us, and that we would learn that he is sovereign over all things, and he's working all things together for the good of them who love him and are called according to purpose. And we therefore have no need to fear. In fact, we have need to go ahead and to hilariously celebrate in joy and in victory our king at all times. We will be used by him to do his will.